Ipswich Town and Sheffield Wednesday will be rolling back to 2023 on Saturday and their League One promotion rivalry, both looking to return to winning form after defeats last weekend, but with very different agendas in mind. This is the Blue Monday podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast, discussing the town up or down since 2015. I'm Rich Woodward and welcome to the free match show brought to you in partnership with the best pub in Ipswich, the Greyhounds. We're available live every Thursday, 8pm on YouTube and available on podcast shortly afterwards, giving you all the insight you need ahead of town's game on Saturday. Back once again, it's seven, I think, in a row, said this, this configuration, you and me. Uh, welcome back. How you doing? Feeling that uh, it's been a feels like a long week. I don't know about you. Uh, talk to me about it. Really wanted a midweek game after Cardiff to try and you know get it out of our system. I would have preferred it if Bristol City had been seven days later, so that you can quickly react and hashtag go again as all the footballers put on their socials these days after a defeat. So it does feel like a bit of a a bit of a while. But I'm enjoying. I'm making the trip down tomorrow night to Suffolk for uh, for the match on Saturday. So looking forward to that and looking forward to going to the Greyhound because. For the West Brom game, my last trip back, it was a stupid early morning kickoff, so I didn't get to save the Greyhound last time. So very much looking forward to going there and hopefully see a few of you guys in the chat there as well. Yeah, looking to turn our frowns upside down from last weekend. I don't know about you. Um, well, I, I know about me. I joined Ben for his watch-along live stream for the whole like whole game. And it's very different when you have to talk about it and you know that you're on a live stream with hundreds of Leeds fans. You kind of have to keep your emotions in check. But I was kind of numb after watching last weekend. And I'm sure the players will have felt like that as well, because usually the shoe is very much on the other foot. So, yeah, as you say, it would have been good to have a game to kind of exercise a little bit of what happened last weekend. But we know that that we've got a good team. We know that we're challenging at the right end, um, but it's going to be a tricky one, isn't it, on Saturday? We'll talk more about it. But uh, yeah, any overriding emotion still lingering for you, Seb, or are you kind of back super confident as you were before? Obviously, incredible frustration after the manner of the defeat. You know, if you go down 2-1 and you concede a couple of goals in the first half or throughout the game, you know, you can sometimes accept it. To lose it in the manner that we did, especially because we're normally so good at that in-game management, closing out games, as we've seen for the last, you know, 18 months or so, it's one of our one of our real strengths. So really frustrating manner to lose the game. But as I've kept telling myself all week, this is a squad and a manager that bounces back really well from defeats, doesn't it? You know, we've never lost two on the bounce under McKenna. We tend to, uh, this season, when we've had poor results, we have then gone on a bit of a winning run. So I'm fully confident they can do that again and look to hit these final nine games. Nine, Yeah, nine games, eight games after Saturday and hopefully build some real momentum because we're probably going to need something ridiculous like 25, 20, I don't know, 23, 24, 25 points from the remaining games to to, to guarantee ourselves a, a top two finish. It's it's crazy. We'll discuss our opponents in a minute. We had this title, not title, promotion shootout with them last summer in a freak League One season, and, it, and it's just the same again this year. But yeah, fully confident that this squad will react well because we always have done under it. There you go. There's your podcast. We'll end it there, shall we? Because... <laughs> I know. You, I was very impressed on the live stream. Obviously, Ben was doing the, the the kind of more emotional stuff, and you were very calm and collected. And yeah, I have to say, you 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 you, you were using a lot of, a lot less profanities than I was using <laughs> in my living room at the time. So I doffed my cap. Fair play to you. Yeah, maybe if it was like a, an Ipswich Town only audience, I think you can afford to let yourself go. But I'm kind of one of these people who said that. Um, you know, people react to football in different ways, and maybe in the olden days, I would have sworn and you know kicked a chair and I know a lot of people do that but I kind of I'm I'm older these days and I'm not going to say wiser but I can't really I can't control what happens on a football pitch let alone a football pitch that is 250 miles away in Cardiff but it's kind of like the football gods just conspired against us as soon as you got as soon as we conceded a quarter in the 99th minute you absolutely knew what was going to happen didn't you so that was in my mind but yeah also my mind was Oh, a load of Leeds fans will want to troll the Ipswich fan who's sobbing and weeping on, on a live stream. So <laughs> I will keep that for myself afterwards. We are live. We want to hear from all of you in the chat. We'll be uh, doing our usual download of 
information on Chiffer Wednesday fans. If you're a Chiffer Wednesday fan in the chat, let us know you're there as well. We appreciate you. Uh, be respectful like, as, as much as we will be respectful back to your team too. Um, but happy to have that discussion. And if you're listening to us also, like Seb, maybe on your way down to Portman Road on the match day as well, let us know you're there. Uh, tweet us or get involved in our socials at Blue Monday ITFC. Always great to hear from you. But let's hear from folk in the chat. And Colin is here. And he is doing something fantastic, seemingly on Saturday, Seb. Um, check presentation on in the fan zone on Saturday to the Heart Foundation and Cancer Research UK between 12.30 and 1.15. Be lovely to see everyone. Congratulations, Colin, on all of your hard work there. Great causes as well. We know they're close to your heart too. Um, so please give Colin your support. Fantastic. And great to have you with us, as always, Colin, in the live chat too. Uh, Stuart is with us, feeling positive like Seb. Feeling positive about this Saturday. We are still very much in the automatic promotion hunt. Yeah, we are. And and uh, no Leicester playing this weekend as well. The, the kind of narrative around Leicester is starting to percolate a little bit as well. So uh, maybe some interesting pressure that we can apply to Leicester, hopefully this Saturday as well. Uh, Andy is here. So glad I can be at the Wednesday game Saturday. Uh, the Wednesday game Saturday. Yeah, that's a Ted Lasso joke, isn't it? Um, I'm flying over from Boston. Great to have Team Boston with us um, as well on Saturday. Um, and Collins raised two and a half thousand pounds he's added in as well. Brilliant. So if you've got a link to share, Colin, we'll happily retweet that. Or the book is still available, I think, on Amazon. It's, it's the book, isn't it's the it? Book, is Colin, the book, of course, yeah, it's the book. Colin's yeah, mentioned okay. it further down. It's still on Amazon. Yeah. So by all means, Colin, if you want to, I don't know, stick a link or something in the chat. If you Diary can, of you know, an obsession. There you people go. People can click on stuff. it. Yeah, well, great, great work. Really good work. Evening to Paul, who's with us. Uh, Steve is with us as well. Great to have you. Uh, Gary's here. The the team uh, Telegram are with us as well, which is always great. Great to have you with us, Gary. Um, as is Richard as well. Nick. Um, Another Telegram VIP. Time for a positive reaction to last Saturday's disappointment. The weather report is with us via Michael from Brisbane. Twenty A cool 24 degrees in Brisbane. G'day to Ben as well. Another of our Team Australia. Uh, loving having you guys with us as well. Ancient, ancient tractor. I wonder if he's more ancient than me. That's the monkey off our back, he says, now to win the rest. Uh, Jerry, uh, greetings from a, yes, you've guessed it, a very wet Wales. He says, let's get back on it this weekend. Here's to three points. Um, it's also wet where our mate Tim is as well, down in, it's always wet in Plymouth, isn't it? Down out west, so it's always wet where you guys are, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Jerry, South Wales, I think. He says it's wet there. It's very much wet in North Wales as well. Yeah, uh, lovely stuff. Uh, weather weather chat tick. Lovely. Hashtag weather chat. Uh, Matt, back with us as well. Evening, everybody. Another tough game to come on Saturday. Keep the belief and keep up the fantastic support. Thank you, Matt, for getting involved as well. Charlie also suggested he's, he, the emoji might undersell maybe the comment there. Going to be a tough game on Saturday. And then this crying, laughing emoji face. Maybe not. Um, but I, I think it's a tough game, Seb, and we'll talk more about why later on. Um, Norman, I thought we looked leggy last weekend. So for me, no game this week is a welcome bonus. Fair enough. And it sounds like, Seb, maybe a little bit of illness in the camp as well. We know about Luongo, but maybe others have been suffering or were suffering as well. So a bit of time. Get a Barocca in the system. That's my... Uh, that's I'm my, sure that's what they use. I'm sure the professional yeah, athletes, professional sport. the sports science team, they just use Barocca. Yeah. Two things, uh, trying to keep colds at bay and a really great thing to neck um, if you've had a hard night out and, and want to get up and be at your best in the morning as well. Um, drink responsibly. Kids, uh, Chris, Michael, Neil, everyone's here. Great to have you with us. Uh, Nick as well. Um, thank you everyone for getting involved and we'll dip into the chat throughout the night as well. Um, but yes, yeah, Seb, let's uh, do a bit of a roundup of news. Uh, the uh, I should have to talk about this because I'm going to be really cynical and moany. I think a lot of people have got the wrong end of the stick of these Ipswich aquatic centre plans, haven't they? But the Cobble Seeing... stand looks amazing. What are you talking about? It looks, yeah, it's, looks phenomenal. It's, it's signed off. It's massive. It's bright yeah. blue. Yeah, and, yeah. I was and... surprised by the colour. I was that did surprise yeah, me. Yeah, it's a bold uh, choice. When I saw the bright, the bright blue, I thought, yeah, that's a yeah, like you say, it's a bold choice. So uh, unless the Unless I've heard, unless I've read otherwise, the Cobalt Stand is not part of those plans. That is an artist render, folks. But nevertheless, the, the plans show progression and a strategy overall that is positive for the club moving forward. And the plans that we know that Mark Ashton has talked about, albeit not as progressive maybe people think, to redevelop that stand in the course of time and, and evict you temporarily and then give you a nice plush seat to come back to. 
Well, evict me from my stand and from my car park by the looks of it. So, Ooh. yeah, bad things happen to good people. <laughs> Ipswich Borough Council and Ipswich Town Football Club did not take into account people that drive big trucks and can't get them into multi-storey car parks. But there we go. No, it looks great. It's great for the area, isn't it? You know, it's an aquatic centre. By all accounts, Crown Pools is quite tired these days. So it's great to have this kind of fresh development, fresh investment going into the football club area. We know the ownership, the three lines have a background in property development. So I'm sure they're looking at this very, very closely. And obviously the big plan was... Portman Road seems to kind of go a bit curvy outwards, doesn't it? Which will then enable you to build backwards. We know the cobble stand needs replacing. We know it's tired. It's simply not fit for purpose anymore. That's where you're going to kind of make your main entrance to the club facing the town. Ashton's spoken in the past about the club being the wrong way round, and that's going to be your amazing corporate facilities that you can rent out for corporate dues from London being an hour on the train and add Port to the revenue Podcast stream. Live events, but- maybe podcast live events maybe um but that's probably all bigger bigger kind of picture stuff you know the the, the render won't be the, the design probably won't be what we saw in the uh the artist's impression it was simply to give an idea of what the area will look like uh, at some point in the future i'd imagine the cobble stand is still several years down the line you know it's going to be a hell of an investment we've seen figures from palaces kind of design of, of building a stand and forests design going close to was it 80 90 100 million pounds you know these are huge huge investments that you have to get right it's about timing um we know we're up against it with ffp i know infrastructure stadium infrastructure is stripped out of ffp but it's still going to be a ridiculously uh a huge outlay for the club so it's important they time it correctly but it's great to see that the the foundations should we say are in place for this the kind of council are doing their part i'm sure there's constant dialogue between them and the football club and watch this space at some point we will see what they do with it and it will look outstanding you know we see the what, what ashton did at ashton gate with their new stand it's a very impressive structure and yeah let's uh let's hope he can he can follow suit with ours because it needs to be done they need to increase the capacity probably by five six seven thousand overall i would guess and um this is kind of probably the first steps towards that yeah, Charlie asked about what the likely capacity will be after redevelopment. I mean, obviously, 35, 36, no redevelopment. I, I think it's got a cap out at thirty-five. I don't, I don't see it. Need, we, I don't see us needing any more than that. But I think what it will do is massively increase, as you mentioned, the corporate hospitality, which is a huge money spinner. So that definitely seems to me the plan. But as it, as of yet, for those of you, apologies if I pissed in on anyone's chips. But if you want information about the new cobbled stand, the Ipswich Aquatic Centre plans are really of very little significance important around the the stadium area the plan for portman road but the look and feel of that render is not something to read too much into folks sorry about that um but i might be wrong of course who knows stranger things have. it would be funny if it came out now and it was just massive bright blue we'll look idiots it looks doesn't look like the bristol city main stand though doesn't it so it does yeah yeah um but we'll keep our eyes peeled on that and expect more from the club i'm sure in due course itfc women um no match for them this weekend so we can um we'll head straight to sort of sheffield wednesday in a second but um the ticket's still on sale for the game ne- next saturday against chatham at portman road really um great milestones being ticked off in respect of those ticket sales Five thousand it was last weekend so hopefully those are increasing a lot of great stuff i think to all intents and purposes um, in terms of the match day experience, uh, the club are trying to replicate as much as possible what you'd experience watching the men's team. So all four stands are open. Not all of the tiers are open. Fan zone, I think, is open as well. More information to come from the club, of course, on that kind of stuff. And I guess kind of health warning um, about content next week. We've got some stuff planned, but we will be focusing on that game because it's right to we are big advocates of the women's game, particularly me and and Seb has recently got involved in that as well so it's not going to be kind of a full pre-match show live show as we do there'll be lots of different bits and pieces we'll be putting out but I guess my my polite request of everyone is if women's football is not your cup of tea and of course we understand people have choices take a position of neutrality um, rather than a position of criticism without having given it a chance I, I see a lot of that of course I know people have different opinions and may have got different perspectives and biases around women's football um, but this is an Ipswich Town team that is deserving of our support um, and play the game in the right way and it will be a really exciting and a really great experience for that for the squad um, for supporters like me and everyone else and if women's football is new to you and you're going to that game hopefully we'll give you some insight as uh, you know the, the squad the players and all that kind of stuff to give you some insights to be able to enjoy the game hopefully even more next weekend so you know a, a bit of a early warning there you know as always, we we try to be respectful here on Blimbland, and we hope people will do likewise in the comments, etc. As well. So, and even yeah. if you're not a fan of the women's game, just tune in to see how many times I mess up hosting. That's got to be worth a view, at least. 
There you go. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll flip it round. And, and we'll also hear from Lucy O'Brien, hopefully some other people as well connected to the club too on that. So, um, yeah, there you go. I've done my uh, health warning, got out of the way. Uh, let's talk about the men's team, Seven Shepherd Wednesday, a team we know very well. I guess probably if we are brutally honest, this the, the, the state of play for Sheffield Wednesday as things stand is maybe in line with kind of what we expected. I think we uh, maybe it's a little bit of an arrogant thing for us to say, but certainly the situation of how they um, how they equip themselves in League One, the style of play, etc., the squad, the tactics, maybe the manager as well. Obviously, it moved on before the the ball was even kicked this season. You kind of felt like they might struggle the off field issues as well, and therefore to see them where they are in the table, probably not a massive surprise. However, Seb. Behind that is some really positive recent form and an upturn under new manager as well. So give us your take on on the state of play for, for Shipper Wednesday as things stand. Well, like you say, we discussed last year several times during that run-in how they'd basically built themselves an ageing, experienced squad to get out of League One, arguably with a style of football that maybe wouldn't lend itself to, to kind of higher level and more technically advanced teams and teams with parachute money who can afford better players, etc. But it worked for them. But there were still a lot of remnants of that at the start of the season. And for all intents and purposes, they were gone. They were in discussions to be one of the worst ever championship sides. You know, we forget how poorly they started this season under Isco Munoz. I know there's a lot of stuff off field that he had to contend with, but come October time, I think they were winless, three draws in the opening 10 games. And one of the relegation places was pretty much being consigned off because no one saw them turning it around. And, and, the, and the fact that they, they go into this weekend one point away from safety, they're currently 23rd, they're still in the relegation zone. They've got 38 points, but they're only one point off Birmingham. If you look at the couple of the sides above them, they are on a downward trajectory, whereas Wednesday, until last weekend against Leeds, had won four on the bounce and were very much kind of looking up. They've won 11 of the 37 games played. All of those victories have come since Danny role was appointed. Drawn five, so like Cardiff last weekend, this isn't a side that draw a lot of games. They either lose or they win. They've lost 21. They've got a really bad goal difference. Goal difference of minus 25. They are the joint lowest scorers in the league. Uh, 30 goals I think it is, along with Rotherham. Um, but until Friday night, if, if we were doing this podcast a week ago, uh, the form for them was very encouraging because it was exactly the same as ours. It was four wins on the spin um, and they were really looking to, to, to kind of get themselves into a position of safety. And if they achieve that, then I think that's a, a, a really impressive season given how far gone they were in reality. Yeah, I mean, as per uh, Ben's comment here, uh, if, if we don't get promoted, it's and Wednesday stay up, for example, you, you kind of have to say that that's a, that's a season well done or a, a part season well done for the manager, isn't it? We'll talk more about him later. And we'll also talk about a striker in form who's very much been critical for the recent turn of results, particularly a lot of 1-0 wins. Seb has mentioned mm. they don't score many. Um, they don't, but when they win games, it, typically it's it's one person. So we'll talk about him. Y you mentioned the form there, Seb. Uh, leads aside, which you'll give us a bit more insight on in a second. Wins in there four in a row prior to that leads defeat. And, and against teams, maybe you'd, if you're in a battle for survival, the kind of teams that you want to be beating. Six yeah, very much so. So they, yeah, they were fourth in the fifth game table overall with the four wins before the defeat last Friday night in their kind of Yorkshire derby. I, went, I know United is their main derby, but it was a derby under the lights uh, against Leeds. The wins were against Plymouth, Rotherham, Bristol City and Millwall. So like you say, sides, they probably would have had designs to beat and important victories as well, because suddenly you drag the likes of Millwall and Plymouth back into that fight and kind of make, make, make it a, a, a real competition again was it two weeks ago we sat here and said we figured Plymouth were safe given the goal scoring in their side and the gap to the gap they had to the relegation zone we see it two weeks on and they are now right back in it because all the sides at the bottom of the league that's the one thing that's really gone against Wednesday in the last few weeks is that they win but everybody around them Stoke have started picking up points QPR have started picking up points so although they've hit this decent run of form they are still kind of right in it and that's the the one negative so far uh, for, for this recent run um, since sort of mid-January when they've really really hit some form their away form however isn't good it's 22nd in the away table so to speak with 13 points from the 18 games played they've only scored 10 goals away from Hillsborough all season which is the lowest in the league 30% uh, of those goals three in reality have come in the last two <laughs> though so maybe they've turned 
a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a corner there. The last five away victories is two. Uh, sorry, the last five away games is two wins. Uh, rather than a Millwall, but three defeats before that. But to be fair, Southampton and Leicester were in that list, so side you'd expect them to lose against, and a defeat to Huddersfield, which looked very bad on paper. They got battered four nil, but it did invoke a formation change by Danny Roll that we'll discuss, which then led to a four match winning streak. So although they got battered on that day, maybe some good has kind of come out of it. Yeah, they were very advanced and I think there were at least two Huddersfield goals where essentially a striker is through on goal from the halfway line and finishes finishes the chance. So very much a freak situation there or maybe overcommitted. And yeah, as you say, we'll talk about the formation uh, later on. That Leicester game as well, they were picked off really. There was a little bit of foolhardy playing out from the back um, that Jamie Vardy in particular um, punished them with, uh, created one or kind of did a Chaplin-esque kind of dummy to create the chance for, uh, I forget who scored the goal, but and then and then picked off the second. So, yeah, and again, no disgrace losing to teams like Southampton and Leicester away is there really. Do you want to talk to us about, about the Leeds game? Um, because it kind of felt like they had their moments in that, but generally Leeds had the better of it and probably deserved it in the end, didn't they? Yeah, well, it was a big save at nil-nil. So they lost 2-0 last Friday night under the lights on Sky. Did you watch it? I watched it. I assume you gave it a, a viewing. No. Yeah. I mean, Wednesday looked decent in the first half. There was a decent save from a flick on the corner by the Leeds keeper at nil-nil. And then a minute over... Well, a, <laughs> look at me complaining about going over injury time based on last weekend. But a minute over the four minutes added on at the end of the first half, Patrick Bamford kind of ghosts in the, the left centre-back, switches off, and he taps yeah, not the ball home. Defending. And then... No. And then in the second half, the leads, I thought, were in complete control. It probably should have been more. Uh, Willie Nonto got the second. Again, I, th- I thought they looked vulnerable in the space in behind the left wing back. Marvin Johnson's been playing there. Wes Burns' best mate has been playing there. Um, and both Leeds goals kind of came from that position. So I thought they looked a little bit vulnerable there. Leeds looked pretty comfortable for the duration of the second half, I thought. Wednesday finished the game with 40% possession, an XG of 0.84 to 2.2, nine shots to 13. Did you expect a bit more from them? We both predicted draw- draws in the predictions last week, didn't we? I kind of thought Sky Sports, decent run of form, it's a derby, it's under the lights. I was really hoping it was going to be one of those cauldron atmospheres like the playoff semi against Peterborough, but is that just a sign of how good leads are? Do you think that they kind of kept them at arm's length, didn't really get put under that much pressure and saw it out pretty comfortably in the end? Maybe we were naive thinking that Wednesday could get something from that game given how ridiculous Leeds squad is. Yeah, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head there. I, 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 part of my research of watching the highlights and stuff like that, and and even look at analysing the squad, you kind of realise that we talked about the recruitment, or we no, we talked about the the suitability suitability of this team as a promoted team to to well survive or thrive in in the championship, and that recruitment just wasn't there, was it? We'll talk about the age of this squad. You know, that's a big factor here. The recruitment, I think, is is. It's trying to bring in a little bit of pace, but youth as well. It just kind of feels like you need another transfer window to establish, you know, a squad identity. And he's not going to be able to do that in one window. And therefore, I think when you come up against the better sides like Leeds, inevitably it's a case of our 11 is better than your 11. And unless, unless Hillsborough can, you know, they did get in trouble, didn't they? <laughs> Again, the fans, yeah. um, a certain minority of fans, we used to say, um, just trying trying to make it more of a cauldron. But, uh, you know, Leeds are just, it's a professional job, isn't it? 2-0. Yeah. So, yeah, fair enough. But, yeah, boss Danny Royals made a big impact, hasn't he? So they're really well liked. Seems to have good a good philosophy and a good pedigree as well. And, yeah, um, up there for Championship Manager of the Season, isn't he? I think so. I was going to ask you that. So, yeah, he's obviously, we'll, we'll discuss him briefly. And I'll ask you the question at the end of it. So, we've been appointed since October, managed 27 games, won 11 of them, drawn two, lost 14, 1.29 points per game. He's one of these latest trends, isn't he, of kind of younger coaches that's been biding their time and learning their trade in, in multiple countries and stuff, and then and then finally kind of taking the bullet. He's the youngest EFL, the, the youngest manager in the EFL. He was 34 when he's appointed. I don't know if he's 35 yet, um, but he makes Kieran McKenna look like an, an elder statesman. Previous spells at RB Leipzig as a coach and an analyst, and then Southampton as an assistant manager, both under Ralph Hassenhutl, the former manager who um, the, the, was his Swiss manager, I think, uh, at, at Austrian maybe, at Southampton. He also had a Final spell at Bayern Munich under Hansi Flick, and he followed Flick to the German national team as well. So this is a guy that's really gone out there and kind of, you know, cut his teeth and spent time learning different philosophies, different ways of playing, spent time as a coach, did apparently did all the coaching for Southampton when he was there. So he was the the one on the grass tick, so to speak, um, and done a bit of analysis as well for, for RB Leipzig. Parallels with McKenna, it was a playing career that was cut short through injury. And 
Benjamin hinted at it earlier, and as did you. Do you think, assuming, let's take us out of the equation, take Kieran McKenna out of the equation, out of the equation, because we don't know how our season is going to finish. If he gets them safe and they do get across the line, I think he's in for a shout of manager of the season, don't you? I mean, even if we don't, if you assume up, the parachute sides should. Yeah, you know, I still think McKenna's they... a shoe in for it, even if we don't go up. Do you know what I mean? I, that's you know, you look at where we've come from and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's, I think he's definitely up there, isn't he? Um, yeah, absolutely. If you're doing a top three on the last day, or well, whenever the season finishes, it's going to be McKenna, yeah. it's going to be him, and then, I don't know, they'll probably give it to him wins the league, Maresca or something will be on the list as well. But I think the job he's done there is, is absolutely phenomenal because for all intents and purposes, like I said at the start of the show, they were they were gone. You know, they were three yeah. points. It was all the off-field stuff. The squad looked disunited. There were, weren't there tennis ball protests by the fans, I think, being thrown onto the pitch to protest yeah, against sure. Chanziri? Well, that was Sheffield Wednesday. That was Reading, wasn't it? I think it was a Sheffield Wednesday as well. I'm sure it was. was. Um, they were, you know, he was doing the statements every two weeks saying, I'm not funding the club anymore. So it's a, it was a, a hell of a risk, I think, for him to take this job. Sure. You know, you look at the, you look at the position of the club, the age of the squad, the off field issues and fair play to him. He's kind of, you know, he's, he's, he's taken a real leap and a real jump here for his first job in, in senior management. And so far he's, he's doing a pretty decent job. I would say, I would suggest he, yeah. he probably won't be there at the start of next season. I would say. Oh, there's a prediction for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm. I like him from the outside, and I think from what we hear, he's done really well to galvanise the fan base as well. It's clearly United, similar kind of situation to McKenna coming in here, which isn't it? I just kind of think they're still there, aren't they? In in March, with eight or nine games left, aren't they? They're still not out of it. Yeah, yeah. If 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 it's going to happen, it will happen quite close to the end of the season as well and I, I guess for that reason you kind of think if he was going to be up there for awards and all that kind of stuff you'd you'd think he'd have them say for maybe mid-table by the time this this season ends and maybe that is that's still possible they've still got to face us though and the history Seb um suggests it's pretty even identical 21 wins for Ipswich 16 draws both of what well, we had two last season didn't we and 21 at Sheffield Wednesday wins we all remember the 1-0 victory in September at Hillsborough Connor Chaplin uh, very early in the season obviously uh, Leif Davis getting injured and we were all worried that he was going to have a, a serious injury but he didn't we were go-karting for your 40th birthday then weren't we just to make you feel make you feel <laughs> Thanks, old um, that's alright no problem last game obviously at Portman Road we all know it the 2 all draw last February um, the 2-0 down the Dave referred to it as a sliding door moment at 2-0 because Michael Smith goes through one-on-one, -on -one, takes a heavy touch, can't finish, and then out of nowhere, Nathan Broadhead pops up with a worldy free kick, a deflected free kick from Leif Davis, sees the game end 2-2, as did the game earlier at Hillsborough in the season. We then draw against Bristol City a few nights, uh, Bristol Rovers a few nights later, and we all know what happened next. And the last time we beat them, let me take you back to the very early days of the podcast. Ben and Dave sat in the podcast bunker, probably episode three, maybe episode four perhaps at most it was a 2-1 victory in August 2015 with goals from Tommy Smith and Freddie Sears as we started that season incredibly well we went top of the table about two weeks later by winning at Preston with a Ryan Fraser goal um, and we probably thought well Ben and Dave probably thought we'll start a podcast and we'll ride the coattails of, of promotion to the Premier League that Little season did which didn't know. quite didn't quite work out but there we go yeah I, and you're not doing me a lineup quiz for that are you I've got one do you want it because you look like you might struggle with it well I Barting goal. Yep. Is four, Nutsen... It's 4-4 four, four, effing 2. Of course it's effing is. Is Nutson in at this point? Nutson is the left back, yeah. Yep. Um, so Chambers is right back, presumably. Yep. So Smith two centre halves, one's the goal scorer. Smith and Barrett, yeah. Yeah, Scoose, yeah, Douglas. Do you want some? Do you want some? Yeah, I do it was, want some Scuggles. It was, it was Scuggles time. in central midfield. Now it's the wide positions. Is Jay Tab still around? He was there, but he didn't play that season. I think he triggered an option he after shook. the playoff season, but he didn't finish. He didn't play. No, he's not playing. Larson Torre, Ryan Fraser. Ryan Fraser was the left winger. Yes, you need the right winger. You've got one of the strikers, Sears, because he said he scored. So you've got yep. one striker alongside Sears. Pittman. And the right winger. Nope. No, Pittman. Murphy. He, must be on the, he might be on the bench. Murphy hadn't got. Uh, Murphy had gone by then? No, nope. Murphy was there. Murphy's yeah, Murphy there. up Newcastle, front alongside Sears. So it's just the right winger. <sighs> Very angry mother that rang. Oh, yeah, of course. Off. Ainsley Maitland Niles. Ainsley Maitland Niles. Yeah, we've got yeah. names chucked in here. Anderson, I think. Anderson left at the end of the 14 15 season, didn't he? He did. He was released, yeah, after the yeah. scoring. Yeah. Norwich Heroics. Yeah. Tab probably on the bench. What a team. Uh, Brew <laughs> reminds us of, yeah, Brew was in the, that squad, was he? 
He was, yeah. He scored. He scored the opening goal of the season against Brentford a couple of weeks earlier in the two all. We were defeat. there. Yeah, the two all defeat, two 0 up in we the night. Who would concede two late goals after the ninetieth Stupid. minute? Stupid. Hey? Stupid. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about this current um, situation with the personnel at Wednesday. We mentioned the aging squad, um, and it's been addressed to an extent. But the the big name Seb is Ek Ogbo, who's been brought in on loan and has hit the ground running, hasn't he, in an epic fashion. Um, massive um, coup. Well, I guess difficult to know how to call it to begin with because he didn't smash the world to pieces. I don't know what I'm saying. He didn't blow. He didn't, <laughs> didn't set. Didn't. What's the what? Didn't what's set the, the world alight. Didn't. Yeah, didn't that's good with that. Any trees, didn't. Didn't smash pull up the any trees. To pieces as you, didn't as you didn't butter it. any parsnips, uh, particularly yeah. at, at Cardiff, which is where. But he, he was did before. at the start, so we yeah. we can't really judge him yet because at the start of the season we played Cardiff very early on, and I think he'd scored three in four at that point, maybe four in five, and he's done pretty much the same thing. He got recalled for his parent club, Troy, he's a Canadian international, got recalled and got sent out to Sheffield, uh, Sheffield Wednesday, and he's there top scorer i think he's got six in, in, in his in his last seven games so despite having only been there for like six seven weeks he is the top scorer for them so he's kind of transformed how they kind of lead the line we know him from the the cardiff game earlier in the season he's pacey he's direct he's powerful i thought we managed him quite well on that day i know we weren't great in terms of being two nil down but i think it was more aaron ramsey kind of running the show uh i thought we actually we actually marshaled him fairly decently but he's made a big big difference to them james beadle has come in 19 year old goalkeeper on loan about- from Brighton um, had the first spent the first half of the season on load at Oxford, been capped from England under 15 to under 21 levels. He's had a bit of stability. Um, one of their goalkeepers, Devis Vasquez, has been recalled by AC Milan. They kind of spent the first half of the season chopping between Cameron Bran- uh, Cameron, not Brannigan, Cameron Dawson, Dawson uh, who was their goalkeeper for part of last season, and Vasquez. So they looked to Beadle to add a little bit of a bit of stability. You're gonna laugh, you're thinking you're Jeremy Beadle, aren't you? Sorry. Child. And and obviously we've got history with Sheffield Wednesday and keepers going walkabout so that's all I'm, I'm thinking if you need if you have we if well do you remember um bailey peacock farrell and uh oh of course yeah the yeah. macaulay bomb yeah, yeah macaulay yeah. bomb i'm um, so i'm just thinking Beadle, beetles beetles about there's your Beatles headline walked about yeah so i don't know it there's your headline for the, the flagship i've given you the raw materials you've got to make some comedy uh keep right. going seb Christian Pedersen's come in left back on loan from Swansea, been injured, won't feature the weekend. He's out till after the international break. And Ian Pervader, a uh, right winger, has come in on loan from Leeds. He'll look to add a bit of width and a bit of yeah, a bit of pace down the down the flanks. As I said, Devis Vasquez, the goalkeeper, got recalled by AC Milan. George Byers is a strange one. He's gone on loan to Blackpool. And do you remember the injury popular. that happened to him kind of February time last year that was pretty crucial? They had that central midfield three of Bannon, Byers, and Will Volks. He got injured, and it, it, was, it was quite a big kind of favour for us that, that he was ruled out for a, a prolonged period of time. So he's gone out on loan, as has former ITFC loanee Tyreek Backinson, I'm Bakinson. going with. It's it's like 2022 all over again, because you're going to say Bakinson, even though you're wrong. He's gone on loan <laughs> to Charlton to join uh, to join Freddie Ladapo. So a few loans out, a few loans in. They've kind of tried to address the goal-scoring issues, add a bit of stability to the back, and overall bring the age of the squad down a little bit. For the first half of the season, they were consistently in the top two or three for oldest squads in the league. They signed a guy in the summer, Anthony Moo Samba, we'll talk about in a minute, who's kind of playing right wing that's now been integrated. So they have dropped slightly, but it is still a squad towards the older kind of uh, scale of the uh, of the league. It is, yeah. Let's talk about the change in formation, Seb. Uh, they were it's, doing the 4 yeah, 3 one yeah. Oh, boring. Um, but a bit of a rethink after Huddersfield, as you said earlier. Yeah, so it was 4 2 3 one as everybody seems to play. But they got battered 4-0 by Huddersfield and changed it to a 5-4-1 with wing-backs, which is, they played kind of 5-3-2 more of last season, didn't they? It was kind of Smith up front as the, the target, three solid, huge centre-halves and, uh, and wing-backs. So it's kind of similar to what they were doing last season. They are the fourth most direct side in the division, so they're still at the more direct end of the scale. At the start, they were kind of second uh, behind Rotherham. So I think the football role's been playing has kind of seen them eke slightly uh, uh, slightly towards the, uh, the 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 kind of more passing scale of the uh, of the spectrum. Forty three percent average possession across the season is the fourth lowest. That drops to an average of forty one percent away from home. And they're quite dirty. 13 fouls per game is the average. Fifth worst disciplinary record in the league uh, and joint worst for red cards with five. Five red cards is a wow, lot. It's not it? that many yellows games. actually. Yeah, no, it's all about the reds. They they, they do it in style. I think. Yeah. So yeah, if you're gonna do it. Do it. Got some glory, it, isn't it? Yeah. You know, go down swinging. Um, I, I think Marvin Johnson will talk about is a long throw threat, Michael, but you'd imagine there is 
a long throw. I think Will, hasn't Will Volk's got a decent long throw on him as well. I there see, you go. Remember. We'll talk about him in a bit as well. We, we've mentioned EK Ogbo, uh, six yep. goals, seven games. Basically, I think if you stop him, you go a long way to stopping Sheffield Wednesday. He basically, if you watch the highlights back for the last five weeks, it, it, if a ball drops in the box, Ugbo is getting on the end of it and typically scoring. So a massive threat. But there is a lot of pace, Seb, and direct running out wide either side of him as well, though, isn't there? There is, yeah. Anthony Masaba was the name I couldn't pronounce about three minutes ago. Uh, he was signed in the summer. I think he came from PSG for a million quid or so. Mm. He's got five goals and three assists. He can play down either flank, but he plays as the as, as the right winger. He might shift out. Uh, he might go left to make room for Ian Paveda, who couldn't play against Leeds, being it's his parent club. He's on loan from them. He couldn't play on, on, on Friday night against them. So he might shift out, and they might look to bring him back. And if they don't, it will be JD Gasama uh, playing on the left. He scored the winner against Plymouth a couple of weeks ago. 20-year-old. Um, he uh, got two goals and two assists assists so far this season so they're the kind of young or pacey-ish kind of options out the flanks either side of uh of, of Ugbo in the center of the pitch Barry Bannon is still you going still strong him. 34 years old the the darling of Sky Sports uh not got the same numbers as last season only one goal and one assist he still averages 65 touches per game I look back at the script for the February the two all game at Portman Road and it was 66 touches then so he's still having as much of the ball it's just the fact he's a year older and he's operating at a higher a higher level against much more kind of technically gifted players that he hasn't got the same kind of influence as he used to has he's created six big chances only got the one assist so we can blame the strikers for not taking the uh, uh the chances put on a plate for them but still created 55 chances so he is still fairly crucial marvin johnson has been reintegrated into the side isco munez froze him out completely didn't register him he's come back in at left back obviously we had a brief link with him when we mm. were unsure about uh what was happening with our left back um scenario in, in january he's got three goals and four assists so far this season uh, where's burns again this week yeah where's burns back? best mate from a set piece keep an eye for that one uh bambo diaby is the the the, the huge center after unit at the back fellow center back Deshaun bernard came through at chelsea and man united they've got a couple of issues in midfield liam palmer traditionally a right back or right center back he's kind of been slotting in there recently alongside barry bannon we've already discussed the keeper james beadle he's kept five only 19 sheets. seb what's your thoughts yeah. on a on a 19 year old goalkeeper well, I guess he's one of these new breed. I think, as far as I'm aware, he's pretty decent with the ball at his feet in terms of his kicking ability. So yeah, he's very highly rated England under 15 to England under 21 kind of squads. I know, I know they're in a position where perhaps experience is what they need. Sometimes you need that bit of know-how when you're scrapping for every single point, but he's clearly very highly rated. And I guess if, if you have the chance to do that deal, he's played half a season at Oxford, very highly rated from the England setup with good at the ball at his feet. I think it's a deal you do to add some stability to your back line after a little bit of chaos between Vasquez and Dawson for the first half of the season. Fair enough. Yeah, someone I, I quite like. We mentioned Will Volks uh, appears to be second in every metric to Barry Bannon, but does mean that he's pretty effective. 30 year old central midfielder, two assists, um, second for accurate passes, second for big chances created, uh, only one less than Bannon as it goes, actually. Second for chances created overall, second for accurate long balls, top for successful tackles and top for interceptions, uh, both per 90 as well. So a bit of an engine room type midfielder there. Probably not a, a big creator, but has got those chances created there. So again, someone to to not underestimate in the centre midfield. It isn't all about Bannon. Uh, yeah. There are other players there too. Didn't Dominic Iorfa okay. never okay. gives the ball away. Do you remember Dominic Iorfa? Yeah, we talked One about of... him last time in that game with Villa. One of the worst performances I've ever seen, yeah. Villa away, gave away injury. gold and then pretended to get injury yeah. so Mick wouldn't shout at him. Uh, <laughs> he's back after a three-month injury layoff. He kind of plays the the, the right centre-off uh, role in the back three. He's been coming off the bench in recent weeks, so maybe he might come back into it. Do you want to feel old? Mm. Bailey Cadamartri. Older, sorry. Bailey Cadamartri is the son of Danny and has three goals from 12 starts. So he's one that's come through the, the, the ranks there and is kind of looking to push on and provide a bit of support for Ugbo. But yeah, when I saw Cadamartri, I had a son who was now playing professional football. It added to the the kind of, you know, when you read that Ian Wright's grandson is now playing, <laughs> it all adds up and makes you feel even older than, than you actually are. They've got a few in issues with absences and injuries. Josh Windass and the previously mentioned Christian Pedersen are both out since in January, not back until after the international break. Callum Patterson, the playoff semi-final second leg hero, is out longer term. I think they're penciling in a mid-April return for him. And they've got this weird scenario where they left, they didn't register Lee Gregory, uh, Juan Delgado and Jeff Hendrick at the end of the January window. They left spaces free in their squad for kind of 
free signings they could do for for out of contract players. There is a deadline at the end of March, so they might look to bring a couple of those back in because they do still have. I think they've got two spaces free in the squad, so a bit strange to kind of freeze them out and then have to go back to them two months later. But it's what Danny Rollers decided to do. Jeff Hendrick was a summer signing as well, wasn't he? Bring, yeah, bring, he was under Munoz, he was a loan signing from Newcastle, wasn't he? He's one of yeah. these Newcastle players that's been loaned out for the last two or three years. So I'd imagine if they could have got out of the deal, they probably would have done. I assume they can't, and they just chose not to not to register him for whatever reason. Maybe they have one of those things where you have to pay more if they play etc so it's easier just to have him train and then and not have him involved on the weekend but they might do it by the end of the month for the final eight games after the international break Michael mentions I remember when Danny uh, Kadamatri I assume was the bright young thing yeah there was yeah. a point where he was in match magazine every week that laid me as well him and Peter Fear and um, a guy at um, Nottingham Forest as well who's another midfielder I can't remember they, they had like three or four guys that they just loved and hoped would become the next big thing and they cursed them all um, but yeah, shout out to Match Magazine. I used to love watch, uh, reading that back in the day. Any uh, away kind of stats that you want to finish off? Seb? You are shying away from giving a key insight because you believe that you cursed us with the set piece last week, even though every, every man and his dog, including Sky, were talking about the set piece threat. But you, you believe that you... You created that with, moment, did you, last week? With so, great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, fine. I don't, I don't mind it when I get something right about Ipswich, but as soon as we conceded that goal, like you say, everyone probably said, oh, what's going to happen here? I suddenly thought to myself, oh, yeah, they've scored 18 goals from set pieces. They're the top in the league for it. And then 30 seconds later, they bundled the ball home. So no statistical insight this time. We've discussed they're quite direct already. 64 long game, long balls per game is the joint sixth long highest. Games they love across, <laughs> long games per ball. They love across. 18 crosses per game is the joint sixth second highest so they will look to get those wide players we previously discussed get them to the byline or look at the overlapping wing backs to swing those balls into the box we've already said they don't score enough away from home 10 goals scored is the fewest in the division they are the biggest underperformers versus xg away from home oh, minus seven they should, have, they should have crap. they should have scored 17 away from home based on their xg but they've only consorted uh, only scored 10 10 shots taken per game is the sixth fewest they only average three shots on target per game which is the third fewest and this surprised me only four percent of their shots away from home come from inside the six yard box which is the lowest in the league so we discussed their goal scoring issues they're just clearly missing a poacher aren't they they need mm. a, a fox in the box a franny yeah, jeffers now, of 2001 yeah signing Ogbo has kind of sort of fixed that a little bit and imagine where they would have been with them um, yeah franny jeffers played no, the match day magazine you? darling franny jeffers definitely oh, yeah he? i mean okay. i mean Ogbo is definitely that now isn't he and but yeah, yeah. big chances they were i think Overall, not just away, this is overall home and away. 18th for big chances created and 18th for big chances misses, missed as well. So essentially they don't create that many or didn't create that many big chances. And when they did, they were really bad at converting them too. So I think Ugbo is turning them around. But as I said before, he is, he is there's a lot of you know responsibility on his shoulders, isn't there, to convert yeah. the very few chances that they create. But yeah, as you said, said, watch out for those crosses. Defensively, anything to give us some hope nothing, as well? I mean, we don't nothing know outstanding. Much, Just we, we discussed their disciplinary record. They can be rash, and that's why they are also joint in the league for penalties conceded with six. There you go. Well, there's, we'll, we'll finish with penalties conceded because I can I can see penalties in a red card. You mentioned red cards. There's, there's two bits that we'll stitch together there as well. If you want to get uh, uh, Wednesday Insight as well, Joe was on the Wednesday Week podcast yesterday. We've linked to it on our on our X page slash Twitter for those of you who remember it from the good old days before it became batshit crazy. Uh, so do, head, do check that out. There are one of our fellow fan network uh, podcasts uh, with TalkSport there as well. So give them a, a listen. Um, but yeah, anything else there? I think someone's asking about Josh Windass. He's out injured. Yeah, he's um, out after the international break. Yeah, I mentioned him with Christian Pedersen. They're both kind of back in training, but they're both out until after the uh, un until the break. There you go. So I think I think we've dealt with Sheffield Wednesday, Seb. We'll talk more um, about them in the predictions. Uh, any bits? Let's talk about us after we've done some ad I mean, as always, we're brought to you in partnership with the Greyhound. Uh, head there ahead of the game on Saturday. Who knows who you might find eating a wolfie dog or whatever it is now, the the Natasha Foundation burger and all that kind of stuff. So do head to the Greyhound. Give them your support. Always a great atmosphere there. Adnams on tap. Other drinks are available too. Um, but just, yeah, great buzz there always ahead of the game. Uh, we are back. Flagship show on Sunday, 8 p.m. live, as always, to talk through the game. I, I can't remember who's on, but I think it's... I think ben, I'd, Craig, Joe? I think it'll no, be... No, sorry, Ben, Dave, Joe. It might be Ben, Dave, Joe. I think we might go for, yeah, the, the Holy the, Trinity. Holy the Trinity, three wise men. 
the three wise men there you go uh three is the magic number um yeah so uh join us again for sunday night a lot of you here as well I, I think a good combination of people from youtube twitter and facebook do give us a thumbs up we see the nine people over on facebook who have elliot joe uh, joe's here uh, chris mark jago uh, adam scott ben and one more who i can't see but if you're watching on youtube do like and subscribe uh, we are one subscriber off another milestone we have our subscriber numbers are going um, really well at the moment, turning over really good numbers. So please do get involved. Lots more content coming away. Ho hopefully lots more excitement for the rest of the season. And as always, we've got lots of bits and pieces available for you as well. We've got a NordVPN promo. Click the link in the description to get a discount with us and support us in the process. Merch store if you want. Telegram group if you can't make the game. Uh, join us in the Telegram chat. Um, all the links you need, Blue Monday, itfc.co.uk. Um, lots of questions coming in, Seb, but maybe we'll do with those. Should we do with those at the end? Should we do some predictions quickly? Because I'm I'm trepidatious. That's a word. I used flummoxed last week. Trepidatious of what you've got to say about my predictions. So we'll uh, we'll go there now. Yeah, you're like, not I mean, us to lose, are you? No, 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 not no, nothing like that. But let's have a look at what happened last week, Seb. Look at that. Boom. Eight points to three. You and Jacob had a little bit of a brain fart last week. Um, 195 points, 10 point lead to Telegram. No uh, 21 point lead to you. 11 rounds to six, if you want to call it that way. Um right. when do you if you want to end the feature? And just give me the. I can't. Then we'll have to find uh, something to fill a seven minute gap each week. So we'll, we'll, we might we'll, as well keep it going to the like, end of the season. I'm trying to remember some, someone really didn't like the Football Room 101 feature. It was probably me, but. It was we, you because you lost. I oh, yeah, won I that every week. I was crap like, at it because I cleaned up on that. I was I the a principal champion and oh. you got rid of it, bought in this stupid predictions feature because you know you win it. And yeah. Yeah. S such a random and weird feature. Who'd, who'd have ever thought of done? Well, you get my before. scores three hours before we go live when I send you the script and the research. So there's definitely some tactical play from you going on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've definitely used your predictions and, and therefore I'm 21 points better off. So. That's great logic. But what I will say about my process this week is sometimes just to avoid issues on the day, I will I will update the spreadsheet and I'll just do my predictions because I've updated everything and the fixtures are there. And I put one all for Ipswich Sheffield Wednesday because I was off the back of that emotional, that kind of the weekend that was. Having gone through the, the pre-match research and the chat that we've just had, I'm feeling a lot more confident about the game but because I've got a process to follow and because I think I deviated a little bit from that process last week and predicted a win when I when I was thinking we'd probably draw it and then we lost for the benefit of everyone else I've kept my process I've not tweaked I've not changed I've not read Seb's predictions so hopefully I've done my part it's a bit of a weird week Seb we're missing a couple of fixtures and actually they're pretty meaningful fixtures in the promotion race Leicester was supposed to play Southampton that's now Tuesday 23rd as is Hull v Coventry and um, both rearranged because uh, Leicester played Chelsea in the FA Cup and Coventry play Wolves in the FA Cup so a nice bit of fixture congestion coming up for those teams and has meaning for us potentially um, but any other games there's a Welsh derby something you bloody love on on uh, top there I'm calling shenanigans on these predictions. I did not predict Stoke to lose three two to Norwich. Let I've me... got my script here. I predicted a uh, I predicted a one all draw there. So Correct. not only you might have got the columns wrong. Oh, here we go. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's you're, all right. you're like Seb Blatter, aren't you? Just well, no, you're so you, for Seb's predictions, throughout. read Telegram, not the contributor. That's all that's happening. Right. Jacobs are in the middle. You're on the right. Right. Okay. That's correct, yeah. isn't it? I don't know. I just well, know I didn't we, predict the Norwich victory. Well, I could so. call, do you want to call them out one by one? And then no, we'll it's fine. No, don't you worry. No, you do you. do You You do your own thing and we'll see what the results are next week. Eh? GBH of the year, old people. I, I get I get minimal sympathy from anyone. Everyone bloody loves Seb. Oh, Seb, look after Seb. But this is the kind of, this is the kind of admin stuff that I have to do that no one cares about. And I get nothing but criticism for doing it. I'm, woe is me. I'm putting the predictions up on the screen i'm having a drink and a sulk talk to us about your predictions seb uh, they're the ones on the right hand side 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, big game at the bottom there. Birmingham against Watford. Watford with a new manager. I've gone for a, a Mark Venus. Hopefully, I really don't want to see Birmingham go oh, down. I don't really like him as a great club. Great situation, is it? But I don't want Venus and Mowbray to take them down. Obviously, the, the sad, unforeseen circumstance with, with, with Mowbray has gone against them. But I'm really hoping they can get out of that one. But every week, they fall slightly further into into trouble, don't they? We're all predicting Middlesbrough to, to continue their decent run of recent form by beating Blackburn. Rotherham-Huddersfield is a big game. We've all gone for victories for, for Huddersfield in that one. And obviously, Sunder, you're going you're predicting a Sunderland victory, right? despite them losing five on the bounce and QPR being on an upward trajectory. Yeah, it's a long way away trip. I just kind of, I, I kind of feel like someone needs to kick up the arse at Sunderland. Roy Keane, I think, has been linked for like the a million. That's not going to happen, is it? Do you think he gets? Doesn't he link, get linked every time they have a uh, maybe they have a it's vacancy? Not, but I think it's like a threat, isn't it? It's like if you maybe the owner, the the Louis Dreyfus guys, sort of said. If you guys don't win, I've got no choice but it. Roy Keane's coming. <laughs> when your dad gets home, you watch out. He'll tell you what for. So I, th I think it's kind of that situation. There's the the, the spectre of Roy Keane and then a more palatable choice is made. So I'm thinking they, that might scare them straight, as it were. Um, but who knows? Fair enough. And we're not expecting Millwall to do us any favours no. at Ellen Road on Sunday, are we? No, no, unfortunately not. But and I, you're uh, not expecting any favours from Sheffield Wednesday from the looks of it on the weekend. So, no, again, so I'm going, I went for my one all draw. Um, I, I'm putting it out there. And now it was an emotional reaction to last weekend. Um, time hasn't healed m m me, Seb. I don't feel much better about last weekend, but a week is a long time in football. Home, great record. Wednesday, not great away. So yeah. a lot of logic behind predicting a win for Ipswich, which is what you've done and what Jacob has done. Yeah, I've gone for a, a, a 2 nil victory. I think they don't score many goals away from home. I think, as I said at the start, we are a side that tends to react really well to defeats. So I fully expect us to, hopefully the illness is gone from the camp. We'll probably discuss what we're going to do in a second. And hopefully we can look to really kind of hit the hit the ground running before the international break, before these final eight games. And yeah, I, I think it will be not overly comfortable because nothing at Portland Road these days is ever truly comfortable. But I don't expect us to, to drop points. Uh, yeah, we've got some good questions coming. If you've got any more thoughts, we've got plenty of time. Uh, we didn't talk about the international call-up, so we'll deal with that before we go as well. I'm sure the guys might talk reflect on that on on the flagship as well. But we will come to that. Nick put a really good point in there, so I'm gonna we'll come back to that. So if you've got any thoughts for Seb or questions for Seb before we go, get them in now. But do get your predictions in as well. Um, we haven't really talked about us yet as well, Seb. Should we, should we do that now as well? In terms of, I mean, it kind of feels to me like just keep things simple um so i would expect broadhead to play yeah I, I would despite the angst about the goals and i was one of the people last saturday i'd still play clark at right back i'd assume luongo is over his illness fully over his illness and had a week to get back to it so it's first choice lineup isn't it I fully agree. Yeah, I think so. The only key debating points really, aren't they, are Samiento, I, I think, I've said it before, I much prefer him as a finisher rather than a starter. And I think the game at Cardiff just simply amplified that for me. I think he's one that is much better coming off the bench against tired legs than he is from the outset. The way he kind of drifts in field, I know Broadhead will drift in field as well, but he kind of has, has a habit of leaving Davis a little bit exposed. So, yeah, I'd have Broadhead back in being a home game. Uh, Luongo Morsi in the middle for me. Travis is now free of the, the amnesty is now passed for the, the 10 game um booking so he's good to go as long as he doesn't get six in the final eight games he won't miss um won't make the 15 match three match uh 15 game three match suspension rate clark i would keep as well at portman road that link up with burns as i said in the in the leads kind of analysis they did look um vulnerable in that left wing back space we know marvin johnson does get forward three goals four assists so that partnership that natural covalent bond as harry from bath always used to refer to it as um is an option that could potentially see some joy down there Kiefer moore ran himself into the ground, got the nasty cut. I assume he'll be good enough to go again. And I think just like this time last season, if everybody's fit, we know what the starting level will be most games for the next few weeks, don't we? Yeah, let us know if you disagree with that. But I think Seb and I um, aligned on that. Apologies, I've kind of deviated from the normal agenda. I'm just lost my head a little bit. And knowing that I had to talk, I'd justify a one-all prediction to Seb, who obviously went and absolutely tore me a new one there. Let's see what folk have got to say in the chat. Colin's being confident, as always. Uh, Colin's going for a 3-0. And I love how he's just he's given us the full name. No abbreviations or anything. Ipswich Town Football Club 3, Sheffield Wednesday. No, we love that. Benjamin's going 3-1. Charlie's going 2 all. Eric, feeling similar to me. But Eric, we need to turn the... Uh, every week, I think I... 
I check in that you're okay. We we can win games too. You can predict wins too, but you do you, mate. You uh, don't. Two all. I I just go where the points are, Seb, uh, for the predictions. But I might be wrong. I will happily be wrong. Let me be wrong. Ipswich Town. Uh, Gary's going for a three-one. Um, Andy's going for a three-one as well. Uh, CC Drugs. I'm thrilled. My granddad has a season ticket, but he's sick, so I'm going instead. Um, hopefully, your granddad will get better as well. That's, that's fine. But yeah, uh, good to have you with us, CC Drugs. And um, hopefully, a 3 1 win will be your, your reward for going on the weekend. 3 2 for Mark. If I was to predict a win, Seb, I think I'd go for a 3 2 at the moment. Um, knowing it's the how norm, we isn't it? Yeah, it's the norm. Uh, Norman's lobbed that in completely unprompted. What Seb's forfeit at the end of the season? Um, TBC, uh, we'll come back to that one. Uh, great shout there, Norman. Um, oh, well, I can still win. I mean, it's not, a yeah, of course, you can. Fork- yeah. of course, you can. You're yeah, so patronizing, of course, you can, course you can, can, little buddy. You try your hardest. Yeah, uh, Benjamin's hoping for a Leeds Millwall draw. I'd love that. Um, Ben Neil's going 3 0. Um, yeah, um, Michael's a tough call for the starting 11, but I think we've we feel otherwise, don't we, Seb? Yeah, I think so. I, I I think it's the it will become the established eleven for pretty much the running now. Assuming everybody's fit, I guess we'll discuss international news in a minute. And Burgess might be missing for Blackburn, but if everyone's fit, everyone's in the building, everyone's on the grass, on the grass. then I fully expect the manager to come out and uh, and to and to establish what we know as the the strongest eleven between that now and the end of the season, and just that was... to build that momentum and that rhythm. Peak. Seb on the podcast that was, and that's too many P's to be putting down a microphone. Uh, Charlie wants to end Zabian for Clark. I, I, I can kind of understand the sentiment, but maybe like me, we have to move on from last Saturday and accept it maybe as a bit of a freak situation there. Neil um, suggesting Fridge, George Edmondson to the uninitiated. Thoughts on that one, Seb? Well, I guess, so Burgess has been called up to the Australia squad and their second game is against Lebanon in Canberra on the Tuesday Ooh. before the match against Blackburn on Good Friday. So if you're playing football on a Tuesday night in Canberra, I would suggest you're probably not going to be 100% ready to go if you're even back in time for the game on Good Friday at Ewood Park. So I assume Fridge might well get a run out then and he'll prove himself an able deputy. Call him his proper name. Edmondson might well get a run out then. He proved himself an incredibly able deputy when Burgess was away at the the Asia Cup. So, yeah, I presume he might well get that as a as a run out. Yeah, c- uh, congratulations to uh, to Cameron Burgess for that call up. But yeah, that is a bit a of a slog. And yeah, as someone it's... who's done a, lot, a few trips over to that part of the world, that the jet lag is is real. It's it's not fun. Um, but I'm sure the the club will do all they can to mitigate that. And obviously, congratulations uh, to Burns and Broadhead as well. Um, call ups for those guys, Keith Moore, isn't it? And Keith Moore hat trick, the Welsh of- trio. Welsh Boyles. Uh, base, Mark, Travis, Travis. Uh, say again? No, I don't worry. I think I got it wrong, so don't worry about it. Okay, fine. Uh, Mark wants Travis in for Luongo, um, Charlie with Clark, and Wolford in the defence. It will be Matt. It'll end in madness, he says. But that has been the stables of the defence that's got us to third in the league, so it kind of does. You know, does too much. Wolfenden's probably the most adapt at the back in terms of how we play, isn't he? He's the one constantly adept. looking to receive the ball. Adept, adept. yes, the one yeah. looking to um, to pick the ball up off the, off the off the key. Yeah, it is peak you. Yes, Correcting you. Um, looking to pick the ball up off Wolfenden. Wolfen, no, Wolfenden is the one who will look to pick up the ball off flag key. You've, you've flummoxed me. Um, so I'd, I'd be surprised. I think he's pretty much started most games he's been available for under McKenna. So I'd, I'd be astounded if he were to be dropped. Or rested. I love how you use flummoxed against me. Yeah, you flum. I, I phased you. I phased you. That's okay. You 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 try and phase me. Well, you already have. You slagged me off for my predictions in you. Three one says Gary. Let's bring some professionalism back. Uh, Peter four nil. Uh, Michael two all. He's he's kind of similar no, thinking to me, no. just giving away daft goals and free kicks. Yeah. Uh, Tim and Edgy two one. Uh, Trevor three one. Um, but we will concede. He says uh, Doctor Zach King going for a three one as well. Scott one uh, nil or four three. It's all the same to me. Three points is all that matters uh nicks can't make it sadly um but i hope we smash them um that will be sod's law won't it nick um but yeah uh, we'll see how that goes um and i think that's it for the predictions seb uh, let's a few questions i come in which is great um let's do it yeah let's let's, let's, let's put the bumper in for the end of the predictions and say we'll be back we will be back next week in some form so we'll talk about them then I think Michael summed it up. Risk v reward. Just score more than them. I think that's what we've fair. done all season, isn't it? 
Yeah, Richard Bradshaw here. A game for Broadhead to find space in a crowded midfield. I agree. I think he's, we saw little glimpses last week, actually, although, yeah, the game just got away from us, didn't it, towards the end? Um, but yeah, um, AE says, since Burgess came back from Asia Cup, six wins and one loss, he will be a, a miss there for that Blackburn game, potentially, as you say, Seb. I, I think that'll be... That'll be well, the maybe way. he won't play in the second game. Maybe he'll play the first game against Lebanon and maybe hopefully he might get an early dart and uh, and be back with us by the by the Monday, Tuesday, the second week. We don't know. But if, if we do, we've got the squad to, to deal with it. Trevor, uh, hoping for a boring last 10 with the game one. Yeah, here, here. Here's, here's to like a, just a, a, a Leicester-esque 2-0 kind of thing, you know? Um, nice one. But, yeah, nice and drama's good, isn't it, as well? Um, you've got a sign-off. At the end now, Seb, haven't you? We've got to flip that those roles around. So we'll do that. Um, I think we've dealt with Nick stuff. Are you nervous? We might get players injured during international break. Always Burns occupational will hazards, injured, he always it? does. Yeah, Wes yeah. Burns will get injured. He always does when he goes away with Wales, unfortunately. But no, I mean, yeah, it's 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 one of those you you can't stop it from happening. You have to hope they'll come back unscathed. Um, and, and fingers crossed they they will do. Yep. Um, Peter, would you a big win? And Wednesday are as poor, oh, as poor as we'll play. They were, Peter, but not as much anymore. Uh, anymore. Porksmith uh, reminds us, 47th minute. I was going to I was going to say this. Can I just do this one? Yeah, so Porksmith put it in the chat there. So in the 47th minute, there's going to be applause for Matt Newman, who recently passed away from a brain tumour. When I started going to Portman Road, I sat in the family enclosure with my dad. And Matt and his dad, Roger, were the two that sat next to us. Um, and so, yeah, I spent the late 90s, the burly years, the early 2000s, pretty much sat one seat away from Matt next to his dad. And yeah, a really lovely lad. So really sad that Matt has passed away. So in the 47th minute, please, everybody, if you can, you know, give a give a round of applause because he was an absolute diehard Ipswich Town fan. It meant everything to him. And it was great having him there for those early years whilst I was kind of feeling out the, the, the club and getting to fall in love with the, with the Burley side. So yeah, rest in peace, Matt. And um, we'll give you a clap in 47 minutes, mate. Great stuff, Seb. And I'm really glad that you're able to be part of the game on, on Saturday because of that. That's yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's really nice. And obviously, yeah, really sad news. Um, yeah, yeah as, as always, um, we are back Sunday, flagship show, uh, go to the Greyhound, get a VPN service through Nord, um, <laughs> go to Telegram, Merch Store. Um, but more, I, I, as always, guys, the numbers here are fantastic. Thank you, everyone who's got involved in the in the chat. Uh, apologies we couldn't answer your questions, but do um, keep them in mind for the guys on Sunday. Uh, do give us a thumbs up as well if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on podcast, we appreciate podcast people too, um, uh, even more so maybe because that's where everything began. So do give us a five-star rating and a, and a review over there. We do really appreciate reading those reviews. Um, but thank you everyone for listening as well. And um, and hopefully, yeah, lots of positivity to talk about on the flagship show on Sunday. Hopefully we've given you some insights which you can pass off as your own. We, we are only finding stuff that's out there anyway as well, things that we've seen ourselves. So more than happy to bring everyone up to speed. Um, but yeah, Seb, I'll, um, I'll put some comments on the screen so you can say a little bit of bits and pieces. Um, but, um, I think, is there something else that I need to mention? Oh, well, uh, maybe not. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, happy birthday to our mate Pete. Well, our mate's dad, oh, yeah. Pete, yeah. 70 on the weekend. Uh, he he'll deny it. He'll say he's, he's, he's in his 60s. He'll deny being 70, but yeah. Yeah. So happy birthday for Saturday, Pete. Um, over to you, Seb. Yes, yeah, my turn to sign off. I can't remember the last time we did this because you had the, the six-game winning run, didn't you? you? You took care of us nicely, so a bit of pressure on me. Enjoy the game, everybody, at the weekend. Come to the Greyhound and see us in the booth at the back. Come and say hello to us. Hopefully take some information away tonight and uh, and regale your fellow town fans around you on Saturday. One game to go before the break, and then it really gets serious with the final eight to go. So get to Portman Road. Please give Matt a clap in the 47th minute. Uh, and as always, come on, you blues. 